minutes for questions. And what I'd like to do is uh, take three questions first and then throw them to the panelists, and then we'll see whether we have time left. And there's another time during the day where we can talk further. Yes, and please introduce yourself. The second presentation, um, I just came back from South Africa too, and sadly, I was disappointed by just how segregated it still is, um, even in cities, but I'm, I was very much encouraged by uh, your presentation. I wanted to ask several questions. One, the enumeration system, is that similar to uh, the Slum Dwellers International enumeration? How does, um, what difference, what, what's the same? Um, second, um, one of the things I heard about when I was there was you have buffer zones, but people still settle on that. So who's monitoring that to make sure that those buffer zones uh, stay um, safe, unsettled? Um, and third, uh, so in some ways you are dealing with the easier situation of city-owned land. And what I was hearing in other places is the real tough nut is informal settlements on private land you know, in, in municipalities. So then the electricity company really feels like they can't provide electrical services because that is starting to recognize those settlements and, you know, and clearly there is a private owner. So what, what do you do in those situations? Okay, thank you very much. Great. Uh, we have another question over on this side, yes. Uh, my name is Guy Pfefferman, and uh, I'm an economist. I run the Global Business School Network, so I wanted to ask an economist's question. Um, you've worked for many years, and this is a kind of very complex, multifaceted uh, social engineering uh, program. Um, what are the resources that you put into this? Uh, it, it, it looks to me, offhand, I would guess that a lot of money has gone into this per person. And uh, how do you assess the, the benefits at the end? Thank you. Uh, Susana Lasteria from the University of Wisconsin. Um, I, my question is, uh, relates to uh, gender and rights to land. Uh, in both of these projects, um, it sounds like the Ebenhauser, I'm not sure if that's, the name is correct, Ebenhauser uh, project uh, with the communal land title, um, I'm assuming that everyone in the association becomes one of the owners, corporate owners of the communal land. Uh, but then, and that I think does include women because uh, everybody over 18 is a member of the association, is that correct? Okay. With the individual land titles, are those legal land titles or are, 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 or are those certificates that are handed out by the, by the CPA? Um, if they are, either way, I'm just wondering whose names are, are on those titles. Are women's um, names also included in the titles? Um, regarding the townships in uh, Cape Town, outside of Cape Town, again, when you are uh, handing out the occupancy certificates or the um, residential certificates um, are whose names, what is the criteria for putting names as occupants or users or owners um, on those? And I assume those are not legal titles. Those are just within, within the community itself, recognized within the community itself. And then related to both of those, I'm just wondering um, are the, what are both the norms and the rules for inheritance rights? And do those include uh, daughters and wives? Thank you. Great. 
Thanks. So you have a full agenda here. Uh, <laughs> David, do you want to begin? OK. Um, I think the last one was related to me in particular. And <clears throat> um, yes, the community as a whole owns the whole land. Um, men definitely dominate um, in the rights to the um, arable plots. But it's not only men that own those or that have the rights to those, those, those plots. In the, in the custom, um, the, the current landholder can decide who that land goes to. Um, and many of those situations have been where the woman, a, a daughter, a wife, um, takes over that land and then becomes the, the land rights holder. Um, it's, it's up to now, it's been restricted to the 153, um, primarily because of a restriction on water. There's a, hopefully an upgrade of, a, a, of the dam, and there will probably be additional water that comes into play. And then any the expansion there, there's a particular focus within the community saying those must, that must be particularly for women. Um, that I think it's a recognition that in the past that women within the custom have not actually been advantaged in access to land. Um, you asked whether the, the title is a legal one or not. At this point, it's not. Um, and that's why we are also involved in a, a national intervention to try and get communal rights um, and or a continuum of rights to be recognized and, and, and recorded um, at different levels. <clears throat> so at the moment, it's not. At the moment, in fact, we're still implementing this thing. So. Um, the, the rights that are held are very insecure, some of whom don't have a certificate um, with the local municipality. So this is the anticipated system that will be implemented um, once the land is actually transferred to the community. In terms of, yeah, I think inheritance, I, I explained it. it. It's really, in custom, most often men receive um, the rights, and that currently it would be the rights to communal grazing and to the arable plot. Um, but it's not, it's not unusual for women to also do that. But prim most, most of it, mostly men do do receive that in the inheritance. Um, I, what we found out in Morning BC Park is that uh, it was it was about forty forty six point five percent of the household head was, were women. And so what we particularly did was, was worked out set of criteria with the community of what they thought was the household head. Um, and in a lot of cases, uh, you, you had couples coming together as well. Um, a lot of women who are ne not necessarily married, so... Um, so th what we also allowed was a secondary name on, on, on the list. So there was, there was always allowance for somebody else. So one, so the household head and then another. What we also did though is that also we, we made sure that the tenants were also on the community list as well. So we, I was amazed at that percentage in South Africa. I mean, I think for, for, for that amount of women to be considered a household head, I, I was blown away. I really was. Um, and it's very important as well um, for what it was. But it also shows the urban context and, and how people migrate and move around uh, between urban centers. Um, in terms of the, the inheritance aspect, we have an ongoing community register. So it allows for people to come and register deaths and births and life, basically. But the problem that we hit was the, the tenure certificates are not necessarily updated by the city of Cape Town. So then the local, uh, not necessarily administrative recognition, but the local recognition has a gap for, for, for the, the long-term use of it. There was never intention that it would last so long um, in terms of that we could get quicker legal recognition plus administrative recognition, but we're still stuck on local recognition. But we, we, we do realize that there is a need for that ongoing inheritance or maintenance. It's like a broken tap. You've got to 
when it breaks, you've got to fix it. Just like a registry, you've got to keep it updated. It's very important. Um, I'm going back to the first question from um, Claire. Um, do we use a similar enumeration system to slum dwellers? Um, I, I think we did, but I mean, enumerations are, um, they, they're kind of, you know, quite standard. But what we did was really try and understand what it meant at the beginning. What is the status quo? So we did a lot of the work on the ground trying to understand whether it was, whether it was what the community wanted was this enumeration system. Um, so yes, a similar process was followed, but I think what, we, what we're making sure is it's continuous. Because a lot of enumerations, people come in from the outside, they do the enumeration, and then it goes. What we wanted to make sure was there was some kind of continuity and activity to it. Um, and community ownership is all run by volunteers. The community register office is run by volunteers. They've been trained up in geolocating geo, uh, and mapping, and they're, they're wizards on the computer now. They have all our community facilities have Wi-Fi access, so it can be live data that's fed straight to the municipality the, the, on, on, on correct systems at the same systems municipality in reality. Um, buffer zones, so who monitors? We had a land invasion in 2014 before the elections in South Africa. Um, by one of the political parties, but the people who came to the forefront was the local leadership. Um, and they, they blew us away. They, they literally, because people wanted to burn down the register office, and um, so kind of normal community dynamics, but to its almost extreme, and the, um, the, the, the Safe Note Area Committee, the SNAC, they sort of stood there and hold hands and, and, and stop people. And there, there are very few kind of in migrations, but there's a lot of internal growth is what we find. So you can't stop internal growth. Um, a, a husband, a, a brother, somebody comes from the Eastern Cape and settles in Cape Town, um, and that's normal, uh, you know, it's normal. So, but the ongoing monitoring is very important. Uh, what about privately owned land? I didn't have the opportunity to present our other area, but we are working in another area called Lotus Park that is a very different environment on uh, Prasa land, so the local rail organization, but they're, they're, they're a subsidiary company, um, but so they're not government, so we do have that problem, where we have one and a half thousand households on land that is not state. We're going through a different process with them. Um, but it still is one that one can deal with incrementally as well. Um, that one's been a three-year land transfer in the process. Um, the land transfer part, the legal part, doesn't necessarily take that long. The negotiations to get everybody around the table is, is, is the difficult part. Um, just to the economic part, the feasibility of all of this, I, I personally can't put a, an amount to improving somebody's quality of life. I find that that is um, insurmountable. I can't, the, 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 the amount of uh, value we have, I think, is quite minimal. Our staff members on the ground, we have one local community facilitator on the ground, um, and we have various people who, technical staff, um, as well as ground staff, who we're employing from the local community. So I feel that there is a little bit of feedback. We have a little construction team doing the public space who live in Monobisi Park. So they're all getting training um, and skills development. Um, through the process. Um, I think partnerships is a big thing. So we don't, we don't work alone. We work in partnership. Um, so that's very important. We work with our early childhood development is, is done in partnership. Um, so that network that we spoke about at the beginning, that, that, that for me is the, the, what we need to do. And we need to be innovative. We have to deal with these areas. The idea was to set up the pilot and see how we can roll it out to other areas. Um, so uh, the sustainability of it also means how can we ingrain um, learnings and teachings beyond just um, what we are doing and with the city of Cape Town as well. So this for me is an important platform to actually share the information and get further um, continuity of the project as well. Yeah, just on the economic one, <clears throat> you know, if you consider that 
13% of South Africa's land is in, form, in former homeland, and 8% of the land has now been transferred um, through land reform. So we're talking the order of 20% of South Africa's land, which is either underutilized or unutilized completely. Um, I don't know if, if people that have been to South Africa, if you've driven through the former homelands, in many areas people are not cultivating anymore. And that's primarily because of land administration breakdown. Because they can't trust that someone else's goats aren't going to come in and eat their, their cabbages. So people stop producing. Um, so the value of doing this, and it's going to cost a lot because there are many communities involved and there are many land rights that are, are not clear enough. Um, but the value of doing it means that it's going to be, make a major shift in the economy in bringing those areas of land under production. At Ebenezer itself, many of the portions of land are not utilized, partially because of the lack of land rights, but partially because of the in ineffectual canal system. Um, but there again, uh, there's a proposed new canal system being uh, implemented at the moment, with, and that with an ability to go to a bank and say, here's my certificate for my land right, mm -hmm. is going to make a major difference to the person's decision to intervene, and, uh, to Im invest in their land. So I think, you know, that is going to be the positive spin on the quite large amount of money that's going to have to be spent on implementing this across the country. Thank you very much. I think we are at the end of this session, and so I want to thank the two of you, and then after this, there, I think there's coffee in the back of the room, and we'll reassemble in 15 minutes. But thank you very, very much. And we'll, people have more questions for you. <laughs>